What's up, Nebraska family? I haven't talked to you guys for a little while. I'm not going to lie. Information was coming so fast for a minute. I mean, I could have kept doing... I could have kept doing... How do you want to say... Um, could have kept doing little videos on my phone. Um, you know, just little immediate reactions or whatever, but... I was already in the middle of trying to finish up my analysis of the offensive line. Kind of nascent, simple offensive line analysis. Comparing techniques from you know the way they used to run the ball back in the uh, early 2000s and the 90s what have you compared to the blocking schemes now and sort of trying to do a video about how um, there's something so unique and interesting about how they did it back in the 90s now obviously and you'll see chop blocks and blocks down around the legs and things like that um, as far as I know they outlawed that so you can't really do it but there's other ways to do it in terms of how to get underneath their hips and you can see how tenacious those offensive lines were back in the day. Obviously, if you're catering to an offense, um, offensive scheme that wants to bring in players that want to get to the NFL, naturally you got to get them, make sure that they're solid against the pass, etc. But this goes back to that identity thing. And and honestly, I mean, you'll see in comparing and contrast with how I looked at these offensive lines. Um, you know, you'll see kind of the difference in terms of how they just can't get past you know they they zone block a section but it's so easy to crash in behind those gaps within the sections that yeah you'll, you'll see you'll see I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here so one thing that I always the one of the things that stood out to me when I was always when I was trying to evaluate this offensive line compared to old school was the offensive line back in the 90s under Osborne and Milt Turniper they had two offensive line coaches not just one I'm kind of cheating because I'm looking at the 97 offensive line the 2000 offensive line um, which is again also one of the better ones we've ever had so naturally I'm comparing <laughs> two of the better offensive lines Nebraska's ever had outside of the 94 offensive line but two of the better offensive lines that Nebraska's ever had with arguably I'm not gonna say the worst but not a good one, not a great one not a great one. are you a passing offense or are you a running offense which one are you all right so recruit accordingly you know, we don't need a guy that's 6'10", 6'9", 6'7". We don't need that. Unless, I, they're too easy to get under. You know, so we need guys with good feet, fast feet, and, and can drive off those feet. And are athletic, are light soccer players, you know what I mean? Um, and Dama Kansu, you know, part of the reason he had such good footwork was because he used to be a soccer player. We need those kind of athletes. We don't need offensive linemen that are just, just walls, you know what I mean? We need that wall to move. <laughs> you watched it you watch this offensive line and again I get it zone scheme I get it you're just blocking an area zone scheme but they don't get past the defensive line they don't they don't get past the defensive line and giving linebackers full reign you know you're blocking an area you know what I mean and based on how you cut and how the play designs you're trying to misdirect linebackers to where you can cut across and they get caught up in the debris however like you can read their blocks and all you gotta do is just crash the gaps and if you just crash the gaps you can just explode the running game altogether and it's crazy watching this offensive line now you know to where they're so damn tall so damn big and to a certain degree if you this offensive line 2022 offensive line compared to this 97 offensive line you'll just see the footwork the footwork and the differentials in the footwork obviously they're bigger human beings now but they just look clumsy you do see an example against Nebraska when they were playing Tennessee and granted Tennessee was loading the box they were putting like nine and ten guys in the box and they were bl the if they were pulling guards the linebackers were blitzing that vacated section and they would just follow the, the the pulling guards and or pulling tackles and they were able to make tackles behind the line of scrimmage but typically if you're loading the box like that you know typically you're not going to be able to stay loading the box like that the entire time that's what the option option is meant to weaken that's what obviously play action pass is meant to weaken They're meant to get those guys to back up a little bit um, but even then once they're loading the box that it just counters counters and trap games can sometimes set that up to where you know the if they're penetrating those gaps it's not it's not really relevant right they will use a pulling guard to cross the center to chip 
at the penetrating defensive tackle or blitzing linebacker to chip at him to basically just get him to the matador style do a do a ole knocks them knocks their hips and their footwork out of position to where they can't really make a play the handoff and the read to the fullback or the running back that's coming through so it's timed perfectly to where just punching them out of the gap enough to where the fullback or whoever can just go right straight through and they when they got the ball and they won't be able to even remotely touch them and that guard that was faced up over that defensive tackle or blitzing linebacker is moving on whether it be a linebacker whether he's going to get the safety if there's a crashing down defensive end and I go back and I watch the film on these old school teams it's almost like it's almost like watching an offensive line get slingshotted, slingshot out of out of their stances and just literally shoot past the actual defensive line and they just they just swarm out. They just swarm out and just start going after everybody. <laughs> Secondary linebackers, corners, etc. Just getting in the way of absolutely everybody. On top of the receivers blocking, on top of tight ends blocking down, on top of you know, because they used them all. It was all based on timing. Linebackers aren't trying to be head up on guards and tackles on a regular basis. And when those guards and tackles have quick enough and light enough feet to where they can just explode you and they can they can move almost quickly as you can, it's pretty impressive. But the difference is is that with this offensive line and this zone blocking scheme, ain't nobody ain't nobody loading the box. <laughs> You know, I mean, linebackers are playing back, but they're just bl they're just they're just blitzing the zone scheme because everybody runs zone scheme. You know, I don't see this blocking style, this old school '90s blocking style, anywhere anymore. When they can't even get, when they can't even get a push against the defensive line, linebackers just fill, 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 and just clog the whole damn thing. And again, they they took out people's legs too, but they but they submarine them through their hips. You know, you'll see examples where you'll see examples where uh, offensive linemen are definitely chop blocking and going at the knees. I don't have any complaints per se. Um, that they made that shit illegal because dude you're blowing out a lot of people's knees with that stuff But it worked you're being a dick if you're going for the guy's knees and trying to take his knees out And you do see examples but I saw some examples of the 2022 offensive line once they kind of secure once they get a push They try to break off that push of the the tackler defensive end that they're on and they try to go after a linebacker and whatnot But they're too damn slow They're slow and they're getting beat at the point of attack anyway Why? In my opinion, because they have bad feet. Their feet are choppy. When they're as tall as trees and they don't and they have choppy feet beyond that initial push. And you see this with Ben Hart, you know, on this zone blocking scheme. And this initial push, his shoulders get turned, and after his shoulders get turned, he just basically is lost. And he's just kind of trying to make sure his butt gets in the way. You know? <laughs> he just created a pile because the guy that was behind him was the one that made the tackle. I've grown to not like the zone blocking scheme as much as I used to. I used to really appreciate it. Now, yeah, the zone blocking scheme <clears throat> teaches, almost enables bad technique. And this goes back also to one of the other things that I've talked about before is that I don't, this is the one thing that I, I, I admire Chip Kelly for basically reinventing the spread. Um, you know, a lot of good things come at, came out of that spread. One thing that I don't like about it that I think infected Scott Frost and his offensive philosophy is too much razzle dazzle, too much flash, too much misdirection trying to trying to outmaneuver you. This ain't basketball. And the one thing that I love, well there was a lot of misdirection I guess in back in the 90s too, but there was also times where it was just like two tight ends, loaded offensive line, two guys, two lead blockers in the backfield. And I don't care that you know where we're going. You need assurances. And sometimes that's one of the guarantees. But one of the, th I guess, good things about if you teach the right timing and the right blocking schemes, that it's like, yeah, we're going to go through the A-gap. You know, try to stop us. We're, we can out-punch you. Um, there's something to be said about that, you know, because you stack the odds in your favor. You, stack, you design the blocking schemes to stack the odds in your favor. You don't... A lot of with this misdirection stuff, you're relying too much more on hoping that they misread it and they go the opposite direction. Um, when you know guys start reading your stuff really well, it's like you're kind of you're kind of left on an island. If everybody's collectively attacking the A gap or the B gap, um, you have help. And when sometimes when you have two guys, the whole point is to create isolation. You know, isolation, two guys on one. You know, that's what you're trying to do. 
And I just see so much of a lot of this misdirection. It creates too many one-on-ones. And when you're creating too many one-on-ones, it's, there's there's too many win there's too many wins and losses. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's not it's not again it's not setting yourself up for victory. And the next thing, how about this? The one thing that I was thinking about as I was just kind of taking random notes, you know, to add on to the offensive line video, and how this defense is historically bad so far. They're so bad that it, obviously naturally we assume. Pessimistically, we assume that it's just going to perpetuate. It's just going to keep going this direction, right? <laughs> Ironically, the three worst coaches Nebraska's had, in my opinion, right? Bo Pelini did a damn good job. You know, he, he wasn't great with he wasn't great with quarterbacks. He wasn't great with in-game adjustments. Hence, when we got blown out, we got blown out. When we lost, we got blown out. Um, but by and large, Bo Pelini was a legit coach. Frank Solich was a legit coach. And when he made all those coaching changes and brought in all those new coaches, I felt like they could have started doing some, make some damage. If you would, if they would have given Solich and those other coaches a good another four years, five years, I felt like Nebraska just would have stayed, boom, stayed right along, and if anything, kept improving. But I swear, nobody can win here except Tom Osborne. And the three worst coaches that Nebraska's had, ironically, at the end of their tenure, always their last year when they were getting fired, historically bad defenses. The 07 defense. Callahan's last year. We had the 2017 defense, Riley's last year. Now this defense, Scott Frost's last year. And what's cool, I didn't just say that. <laughs> what's fascinating about this is which defense was worse? Out of all those all three of those defenses, which one was worse? So I looked at some stats. Let's see. We're just gonna throw a couple stats out here. So this year's defense so far. You know, we're only three games, what, what, four games into this thing. We're only four games into this thing, right? Opponents, opponents are getting 35, 35 points a game. We're giving up 233 yards a game rushing. Passing yards per game, we are giving up 280 uh, yards a game. And total yards is 514. All right, now let's look at 2017, Riley's last year. Uh, 36, give up 36 points per game. They were giving up 214 yards per game. They were giving up 221 uh, passing yards a game. And they were giving up 436 total yards a game. Okay, all right. Now let's go to Callahan's last year, 2007. 37, 37.9, so technically they were giving up 38 points a game. Rushing yards a game, rushing yards a game, they were giving up 232. Passing yards a game, they were giving up 244 passing yards a game. And total offense yards uh, per game, they were giving up 476 yards a game. And if you round that up, 476.8, so 477 yards per game. So which one's worse? <laughs> I posit that question to you guys. Somebody answer me. Which one, which out of all, if you had, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, you need, you, you can only have one of these three defenses. Obviously, we still have the rest of this year to look to, so maybe this defense will get a little bit better, you know what I mean? But as of right now, <laughs> which one of these defenses would you take, right? I mean, the 200, the, the, I did it again, 207. The 2017 had some all right players on it, you know, because obviously we ended up having one of the best defenses Nebraska ever had in 2009, so there were still some leftover players from this 2007 defense that were on that 2009 defense. So you can look at it that way. But in terms of numbers, oh, oh my goodness. In terms of just numbers, ah, that, that, uh, that 2007 defense was pretty historically bad. Well, I mean, this, this defense right now this defense right now is giving up more yards a game. You know what I mean? They're not giving up as many points, but they're giving up more yards. It's a toss-up, man. <laughs> I'd say the 2000 defense, 2007 defense, as of right now, is still the worst I've seen in Nebraska. All right, moving on. The next ridiculous thing. It's, it's still, for the most part, kind of a rumor. You know, not really a rumor, but maybe a conflated exaggerated claim you know to where there's nuances that are involved but it is easily the most ridiculous thing I've ever fucking heard 
and that being just the lack of physicality and the lack of training that these players needed to get ready for each season. How do you have soft training camps and expect anything other than what we see on the field now? Tagging off, Miles Farmer throwing old coach under the bus. And yeah, we did. We had more one-on-one -on -one periods, ones-on-ones. We had more live periods. It's not going to happen overnight, you know? We've been tagging off for four years. Okay, so if that's really true, if that's really true and all the other rumors are true, you know, with how negligent Frost was being, that's the most pathetic shit that I've heard since what I heard about Mike Riley, you know, with, with his philosophies in the weight room, you know, optional squats, optional weight room stuff. How true is that rumor? But who knows? I mean, hey, this is this is the barbershop, y'all. This is, this is just us talking about it. You know, it, it showed on the field because the guys look soft, they look small. So it was easy to believe that. You know, we knew he was intelligent as hell, but we also knew he was kind of an asshole. He was kind of had a big ego, etc. Um, but the rumors that we we're hearing in terms of ne just pure negligence, um, in terms of just flat out acting like he just don't give a damn, uh, I, I got no answer, and that sucks. I swear to God, like Nebraska's, then no matter what they try to do when it comes to this coaching thing, they they they, they do not know how to find coaches. <laughs> Well, guys, I will say this, that um, I want Mickey Joseph to succeed. I'm not really into any all these coaches that they keep, that all these rumors that keep popping up. I'm not not excited about any of them. None of them. Not the Urban Myers. I don't, there's reasons I definitely don't want him. Um, not the offensive coordinator from Alabama. Um, I can understand the fascination with the guy from Kansas. I love Mickey Joseph. I think that guy's a leader to and through. And I think he's got head coach written all over him. If you've been coaching forever, and you know how to lead men, you know how to recruit, um, you know, it's kind of like filmmaking, you know. Filmmaking, you know, Quentin Tarantino said it best. He said, you know, I don't need to be the best editor. I don't need to be the best cinematographer. I don't need to be, um, um, know absolutely everything about cameras, you know. Um, that's what we hire people for. In a lot of ways, at the end of the day, whether it be called the CEO, call it whatever you want, um, just be a leader of men. Be a leader of men. Be a good recruiter. Um, have connections all over the country, which Mickey has. Check, check, check. All those things. Outside of Frank Solich, Frank Solich wasn't even a head coach. You know, he was an assistant coach for how long? And then Frost promoted him. Or uh, Osborne, Tom Osborne promoted him. And he was a legit coach, man. And he, he, he got screwed. He didn't get a fair shake. You just need specific qualities. I mean, this is just my opinion. You need specific qualities when it comes to a head coach. Um, you don't have to have had been a head coach in the past and shown that you can flip multiple programs and make them winners. And you know, because to me, that's that's a that's a formula for pulling a pulling a freaking Riley. You know, jumping from Oklahoma to USC. You know, he's just what's the next big paycheck? What's the next big flashy job? And it's like, you know, Nebraska people they don't want that. We don't want that. We want a guy that's going to hang around for a while. We're we're at the lowest that Nebraska's ever been. Man, we might not win another game this year. We just might not. Man, we might not win another game this year. As I say, <laughs> we might not win another game. Obviously, when I recorded that, it was uh, just, it was literally the night before the Illinois game. Or not the Illinois game, but the Indiana game. Now we've seen Indiana and Rutgers. So Nebraska's learning how to win the close games again. Have both these wins look flawed and look sloppy? Yeah. I'm actually surprised. I'm really surprised by how many penalties they're getting right now. Going back to me breaking down and talking about um, the worst defenses that Nebraska's ever had. I did put a caveat in there saying, well, we still got several games left, but this could, this 2022 defense could end up being the worst Nebraska's ever had. And in these last two games, simplifying everything, Bill Bush doing a better job of adjusting, not playing it safe, actually, oh my goodness, finally getting to see these guys play press coverage has been awesome. Um, even though guys are getting beat, I don't care. It's so much fun. It's so much, I love watching them be aggressive versus just sitting back and giving them open flats all day, every day. Always giving up third down conversions. It's like we're basically not competing. It's like we'll let you we'll let you have everything in front of us and then we'll come up and tackle you. I, that's prevent. That's prevent. I can't stand prevent. Prevent is for one time of the game and one time only. 
Their tackling has looked better. Anyway, it's the defense is playing a lot better. The offense is the offensive line still looks terrible. Um, the you know the the pro style offense I still can't stand. You know what I mean? But at, at the end of the day, the, the mentality, the mental, the, the the mental health of this team is looking so much better, so much better. You know, now that essentially we've gotten the cancers out and come to find out, as I already reiterated, some of the toxic stuff that we didn't even, you know, we weren't privy to. We weren't privy to. And it's just so much better seeing a team take advantage of its unity and a coach that is equally as passionate and fired up as they are and holding them accountable. Rotating guys, rotating guys on a regular basis, rotating guys in the secondary, rotating guys on the offensive line, trying to find the best balance. If a guy's not performing, he's coming out. Even Casey Thompson, if a guy's not performing, he's coming out. Like, that's so good to see. Frost, I swear to God, let's pretend that all the rumors are not true. His loyalty was, is a great quality, but was, as far as football's concerned, was to a fault. His loyalty to Adrian Martinez was to a fault. His loyalty to certain coaches was to a fault. His inability to shake up players that weren't performing and just keep them in there. Um, this day and age, it's just it's not going to work. It's not going to work. If guys aren't performing, they need to know that they their job is not safe. He would say that, but you know, the results on the field were different. And this team is winning close games. How far can that go? I mean, can they can they reduce their mistakes and not be, look so sloppy? Um, sure, but as of right now, they have become a fourth quarter team, which is pretty impressive. Drastic improvement just within the simplicity of what they're doing and showing that they're able to make adjustments and able to be, be malleable. I swear to God, the one thing about that, Scott Frost, uh, Shenander, just the coaching staff in general, and Shenander and Scott Frost, is that I think to me they're a good example of two things. A good, good example of... Um, over intellectualizing something that really is fundamentally fundamentally simple um, and overthinking it and also not being malleable being stubborn in your ways the arrogance the arrogance that comes along with what seems to be the trend within offensive minded coaches Bill Callahan was the same way you know wasn't really all that interested interested in special teams wasn't all that interested really um, within having special top-notch defenses um, you know, because he believes, they both seem to believe that they're, you know, astute, well-educated, amazing offenses was enough, enough to win games. And it's like, are you kidding me? So this offense, or this uh, this team now with Mickey Joseph showcases that it's like, no, nah, they're bringing back the simplicity of what it takes to win everywhere at any time in history within football. It's never changed. It's never changed. A lot of rules have changed, but still the fundamentals um, have not changed. We're seeing that rugged and that grit and that passion come back, and it's a beautiful thing. How many how many games can Nebraska win now? Ooh, ugh. Who knows? But when you have a team that believes and is winning the fourth quarter, good stuff can happen, guys. And the hype train. So, like I said, I'm rooting for uh, rooting for Mickey, but naturally, as Nebraska fans do. We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. <laughs> just after the just, just after the Indiana win, all of a sudden everybody was changing their tune. You know, I would hate. I, I've seen a lot of people say that he is head coach material, just probably not here. I don't. I don't care. I don't care. I don't buy that. I would hate to see him go to another school and just start killing it and make us look like a bunch of dipshits for passing up on it. You know, I think he has the potential to be an amazing coach. So I'm totally fine with playing the patient game and letting him get his practice and his head coaching chops up here. When the time comes that he's ready to be an amazing head coach, guess where he's at? Here. That's what I want out of Mickey Joseph. It's in your blood. It's kind of like heavy metal. It's in your blood. Once it's in there, you ain't getting it out. <laughs> so definitely always a Nebraska fan for life and I'll always keep watching every single game. You know, I may not finish games, May not finish the games, but I'll definitely watch every single game. Uh, Nebraska family, Nebraska fan for life. Talk to you guys later. See you on Saturday.